Sagar and Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. While there's broad agreement that the United States is an incredibly polarized political moment, there's a broad disagreement on where that polarization came from. And since 2020 is an election year, we've been gifted with three different books from really great authors and thinkers on this topic. You've got Michael Lind, who we had on the first episode of this season, arguing that the reason why our country is so polarized is that the class-based settlements that protected our politics after World War II broke down in the 1970s. And our task today is to make new settlements that would split power between the working class and the elite of our country. You then have Why We're Polarized by Vox's Ezra Klein, where he argues that our tribalism is rooted in the deep psychological divisions that we have as people, and that the way our society's been structured, everything from media to the way our political system is set up, incentivizes that same polarization. Finally, you have our guest today, Christopher Caldwell. He's got an incredibly controversial argument that the roots of our divisions lie in the failed legacy of the 1960s, specifically citing the unintended and yet predicted consequences of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Christopher Caldwell is really one of the most important and prolific conservative authors out there today. He has covered everything from immigration in Europe to the fact that if you look at the themes of populism and elite failure, you could see these trends everywhere from the United States to Hungary to the Philippines to the UK after Brexit and to France. So mm-hmm. I think if there's someone whose thoughts we have to take very seriously, he's one of those people. Today we want to try something a little bit different. Before starting the interview, we're going to play audio from Christopher's appearance on Tucker Carlson tonight to contextualize the argument. We're going to intersperse with some commentary in between the clips, and the reason that we're doing it this time around is that Caldwell very effectively summarized kind of his entire argument in this just few minutes on Tucker Carlson. And I want to make sure that all of you have that as a frame before we enter the discussion. So with that, let's take a listen to the first clip from Tucker Carlson. People are starting to think that democracy is not real because ideas that have majority support are ignored consistently. What is happening? Well, it's a, it's a little bit complicated. I'd say it's kind of... Um an unintended consequence of, of a good thing, uh, of the civil rights laws of the 1960s, which did away with, um, with segregation. Now, yes. segregation, as you know, is a, it's a big problem. It's, it's our unique, it's our great problem in our, in our history. The original it, sin of America, yes, yeah. that's right, and it defied solution. How did we break it in the 1960s? We did it by giving Washington powers that it had never had before in peacetime. So Caldwell's book, The Age of Entitlement, begins in 1963. It starts right after the Kennedy assassination. Because I think the key thing to understand is that civil rights legislation, all sorts of things that weren't able to be passed during the Kennedy presidency, and this is what Caldwell talks about, were able to be forced through in much stronger versions after that assassination. Yeah, so with that context, let's take a listen to the second clip, and then we're going to discuss. Here's the problem. It's that when legal segregation ended, these very powerful tools used to overturn it did not. And in fact, they intensified. And you got things that, that were not even in the original um, civil rights bills, like affirmative action as we understand it now, um, busing of, of school children. Right. And that spread. You had busing in, in, in Louisville and Boston. So suddenly this reform that people thought of as confined to the, you know, the segregationist South was nationwide. But here's the key thing, and here's where democracy comes in. It spread even away from segregation and even away from race. I think the, the key there is that what Caldwell is arguing is that the Civil Rights Act became the mechanism and the framework through which to spread an entire social agenda that the American people did not necessarily vote for, agree to, or even particularly wanted in the moment or want now. Yeah, and what was so interesting is he, and this is the historical part of it, he talks about how a lot of Northerners who thought about the civil rights issue sort of saw the South as a foreign country. There are these people who were backwards in their economic and social and cultural practices. And the Civil Rights Act was this one-time idea that was designed to bring them into the 20th century. 
But the other example he brings up, though, is that if you were a Irish Catholic in Boston, you did not think that the Civil Rights Act would eventually be used to change where your children went to school through the controversial busing issue. So with that, let's take a listen to the third and the most controversial part of his thesis. So you had a new system that, that gradually took over larger and larger parts of American life. It was like a, like a second constitution that that could be used to override the what you'd call the democratic so so we're so yeah as Sagar pointed out this is the controversial argument that he made he's explicitly arguing that the judicial legal and political framework that came out of the civil rights act no matter how well intentioned eventually became an incompatible second constitution that was not responsive to democracy then he gets to the final part of his argument as to why we're actually polarized Let's take a listen. Well, it seems it has a different effect on two halves of the society, and I think it really uh, explains a lot of our polarization, okay? If you have, I mean, if you're a beneficiary of, um, of this new expansion of rights, okay? Let's say you're um, a gay in a couple who can now get married. Right. Well, then this is, this is wonderful. And in fact, if you're a, if you're a progressive in general, I mean, this is, this is wonderful. The, and, and, and the fact that it's not democratically arrived at may not matter so much. But if you're, um, if you're not a beneficiary of this, or if you're conservatively inclined about any of these institutions, it looks less good. So as he says, the second constitution that came out of the 1964 era is one that he believes advantaged the progressive left and certain parts of the country over others. And if we're looking at why our country is so divided right now, at why nothing could get done in Washington, we could see it's a clear result of these incompatible systems that produce a clear set of winners and a clear set of losers. One quick note, we're going to try something a little bit different this time around. We're going to have... Marshall and I give our reflections on this episode after our conversation with Christopher Caldwell. I'm glad that you have the full context before we launch into the full episode. So stick around. And with that, let's dive in. Christopher Caldwell, welcome to The Realignment. Well, thank you very much. Good to be here. Thanks for joining us, sir. So one of the themes that we're exploring this year, because it's an election year, is the idea that we're polarized, the idea that American politics and society across a couple of different metrics aren't working particularly effectively. Um, and I think one of the reasons we wanted to talk about your book, aside from just like the body of your work, which has dealt with populism and how the broader industrialized world is dealing with all these conflicts, is that your book is making a very direct historical argument for why American society is in the state that it is today. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about, first, just the general thesis of the age of entitlement. What is it that you see as the co- the central cause of polarization in American society? Well, uh, you know, I should make clear that the book is a, the book's a history. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a narrative of, um, of what's happened in the country roughly between the assassination of John F. Kennedy and the election of Donald Trump. Um, so it's not a, um, it's not a, uh, it's not a, a particularly schematic book, but, and, and I trace a lot of, um, I trace a lot of strands from 1963 to the present, some of them involving sex, some of them involving the economy. Uh, the strand that has got the most attention and has probably been the most controversial in, in discussions of this book is uh, concerns the development of the Civil Rights Act over time mm-hmm. as a model for uh, other as a model for other types of of claims to rights, and this is sometimes called the the rights revolution. Um, although increasingly it is described as a side of civil rights. So, for instance, you know Joe Biden yesterday described, you know, transgender uh, uh, rights as the civil rights Mm -hmm. of our time. Um, When it comes to polarization, um, to give give this idea in in probably the the simplest way I I, I possibly could, um, the Civil Rights Act um, was dealing with a problem, um, segregation that is a really special problem. It, w- it is the, probably the unique great problem of the United States. Um, and it was a problem that for centuries in different forms had defied uh, 
solution. Um, the government was able to do away with segregation by using extremely strong medicine. Um, the Civil Rights Act was a strong act. It was a much stronger act than the act that John F. Kennedy was discussing during his lifetime, which people had thought actually too strong to get passed. Um, Lyndon Johnson was able to get it passed through his, his political skill. But it had a lot of new um, government offices and instances in it. Uh, it had a, an expanded role for you know, um, civil rights agencies. It had, uh, it had the EEOC. It had. Uh, and what did uh, that stand for? Yeah, let's uh, explain what right, that is. The, it's now the um, Equal Opportunity, uh, Equal Employment Opportunity right. Commission. Um, the acronym has changed over the years, <laughs> and, uh, but um, it had the EEOC. It had offices of civil rights, um, and on top of that, it had a, a, a whole number of offenses that um, uh, that for which people could now be prosecuted. And sued, and in you know, involving discrimination in a whole range of places, starting with you know, voting booths, um, public accommodations, meaning hotels and bars, etc., uh, public facilities, um, but also businesses. And here, uh, this was very innovative. the The Civil Rights Act took took aim at private association, and so it 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 showed itself willing to tack against, um, um, and some might even say repeal, the prevailing understanding of the First Amendment as protecting not just freedom of assembly, but freedom of association. Mm. Okay? Um, and it worked. Okay? So, so this was very effective in, in undoing segregation. One thing that seems quite clear is that Americans did not expect this toolkit to be used for things other than fighting segregation. Um, and over the years, it was. It came to be used for, um, it came to be used for adjudicating immigrants' rights, women's rights, children's rights, gay rights, transgender rights. Um, and this was an, uh, this, as more and more of the country's political life moved from, let's say, the, the, the old Democratic Republican area of politics that you voted on and into this new area where, um, which was decided by, let's say, judges and, and regulators. Like bus, I think a good yes, issue that would yes. be busing. You could, we could talk about busing, you could talk mm. about affirmative action, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the, the country changed. I mean, and, and, and so you, you had, so things were not just, people were not just changing their minds about, about things, and it's not actually even clear how much people were changing their minds about things. It's just that authority was moving from one government system to another government system. And these two government systems, over time, developed each their own logic. And I would say they became like two constitutions. Right. Let's, we we want to spend some time there, which is like, how did it create a rival constitutional understanding exactly? This is something you get in, in the book a lot, which is that there's a lot of judicial elites and, and others who don't really buy into the founding story of America, but very much do buy into what you call a civil rights constitutional framework. What does that mean exactly? Let's let's lay out what exactly that understanding of America and its history through that lens looks like. Well, that's a that's a that's a sort of a, a cultural question that people will everyone will have a different answer to that. Mm. I'm I think that I'm I'm you know you, you, I mean we all have this you know our own ideas about the you know the history of the idea of freedom in the mm -hmm. world. Um, I don't really go into that in the book. I go much more into structures. And yeah. so, 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 so a follow-up then, something that sort of critics of the book of reference is the idea that the notion, the notion of what America is and what it represents has changed multiple times. So yes, you had the constitution of the 18th century, but you had Andrew Jackson, mm 
his presidency, which sort of changed the notion of who could participate in the democratic process. He obviously had Abraham Lincoln, the Civil Rights Act, Dishes, Civil War, right? Civil, yeah, Civil War, and all that sort of stuff. And the Fourteenth and 15th. You, you, you had the, you had the Progressive Era. Women were getting the right to vote, but then also corporations, sort of antitrust stuff, and then you had the New Deal. So, what was it unique about this sort of reconsideration that made the Civil Rights Act era different? Uh, you know, you, you're just speaking about changing the notion of what the country was mm. about. I think that this, um, what changed in the 1960s is it changed the means through which power was exercised. And um, uh, so you, um, and I quite understand that we've always had bureaucracies, we've always had judges, but they had, the, the, there was a new dynamic that allowed them to produce Laws and one one example you could give is bilingual education. You know, bilingual education is something that the Supreme Court um, described as possible and desirable in a 1974 uh, decision called Lau. But then it was offices of civil rights at what was then the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, I think, mm -hmm. that wrote the guidelines for it and and imposed them on all schools in the country, um, uh, all schools that had a certain number of, of, of people speaking foreign languages. Um, and that was done without a vote. There is no bilingual education law. Um, you could say that um, Roe v. Wade is a, is a, is a similar example of, a, of something that took on the force of law without having ever been enacted as law. Um, so I'm, I'm really talking about two ways of doing governmental business more than two visions of the, you know, of the world. Well, to push you a little bit on that, though, I mean, the New Deal, much of the infrastructure that it solidified here in Washington, you're kind of describing the same thing that we had whenever it came to our intervention into markets and our intervention to a big business functions in the progressive era. So why is it unique to the Civil Rights Act in changing power dynamics when a lot of that power dynamics was consolidated in the New Deal whenever it came to the way the American economy functions. And to interject real yeah. quick, and this is just sort of we're yeah. conversating here, but mm -hmm. I think in my reading of the book, this has to do with legal precedent, right? correct? So the issue here is that the, the legal precedent that comes from the legislation here, is that what distinguishes it between what happened before? Well, that's a lot of, of, that's a lot of subjects. I think what happened in the New Deal was a... Um, was an executive branch moving very aggressively um, to intervene in the economy, and for the most part, getting beaten back by the by the um, by the Supreme Court. I don't think there was a. Um, I believe there were threats to the sovereignty of Congress that a lot of people, particularly conservatives, envisioned at the start of the of the. Roosevelt administration, they, they did not materialize. All of these things, all of the measures of the, um, all of the measures of, of, of the New Deal were voted on. Um, uh, and this is different. This is, rights are things that, 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 a, that a judge can say, you know, this is something that you've always, that you've always had. Mm. This is, um, um, this is not something that we vote on. That's the way for instance, gay marriage was done. There were a lot of votes about gay marriage in the country. Most of them were against gay marriage. Um, and yet a right was found to it, just an essential human right. Um, uh, and it became law that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So connecting this to the, and obviously there's a lot of space in between, but just to cover out this section, and what is the conception between this sort of new form of governance and sort of our current political dysfunction today. Yes. Um, I think that over time, there was, a, there was an interesting sort of weakness and strength in the, in, the, in the civil rights laws. The weakness was if people, if, 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 if the civil rights laws were open to, to voting, they would be vulnerable, right? So long as the beneficiaries of civil rights law were isolated and made up only 10 or 12 percent of the population. Um, but you rap very rapidly had a transformation 
of, of, of civil rights law. There are two things that happened. One, it got deeper. You had you know, things like affirmative action and, and busing. There more was deemed necessary to protect civil rights. But the other is that it spread to other groups. And so you had a coalition of beneficiaries of these protected rights. Now it was not just blacks in the South who were protected, it was blacks throughout the country. And not, and, and, and not only that, it was, soon it was women as well could claim certain rights. And pretty soon you had a coalition of people who were protected by this way of delivering rights. And they had an interest in strengthening it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not just this collection of beneficiaries of the rights. Actually, the people by whom the rights were delivered had an interest in, 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 in extending it. Um, judges, regulators. At the same time, you had people who were not the beneficiaries, who tended to perceive the changes that came as things quite correctly, actually, as things being taken away from them. And who you know? were those? And, and, and what's just, like, who were those people who were not the beneficiaries mm. and what was being taken away, at well, least in their perception right. or in actuality? Right. So at the beginning, I think that, um, as they described the way Americans viewed the situation in the, in the early 60s, I think that Americans thought of civil rights as almost a foreign policy issue. It had to do with the South. It was the stuff they were watching on TV in the South. And there was a cast of villains Mm -hmm. who were obviously in need of correction in the mind of of, of the country, but they were rather small. Then came a next, uh, the next period when it was clear that, that, that when we talked about civil rights, we were talking about a nationwide program, right? And then you had a different set of people who were having things taken away from them. For instance, the families in an ethnic neighborhood in Boston who, you know, had children who were going to play on the same high school football team that their father did and their grandfather did and their great-grandfather did, were now told that they would be going to a different school in a different and probably dangerous part of town. Um, and then it spreads on from there. I mean, it's basically the, the story of um, intersectionality, you know? Mm. It spreads to women's rights. And men are told that, you know, you cannot sort of like make the same jokes around the, uh, you know, around the office, you know, meeting table that you used to and um it goes on you mm. know so this is interesting do you think so speaking of the internet intersectionality idea i feel as if what we're really talking about there and this is what michael lynn discusses in his book is the idea that elites particularly college educated elites gained more power culturally economically but politically and were able to really sort of input their like social um, rules and expectations into society and you see this in other societies too so if this is purely explained not, not i'm not saying you're saying this is only because of the civil rights act but why do these same trends happen in other industrialized countries as well too i'd say other industrialized countries go like whether france or germany they also go through women entering the workplace they also go through men having to reconcile themselves to changing relationships to the family you have secularization why is this happening globally okay mm-hmm. well this is a now we've got another whole set of things on the table i'm not really talking about social change here i'm talking about the set of laws through which the social change is delivered mm-hmm. so i just mentioned Roe v. Wade, you know, in all of the, in all European countries, you had abortion laws, you know, abortion was liberalized with a couple of exceptions, Ireland, Malta. Um, You had abortion laws liberalized around the same time, but they were liberalized by law. I mean, parliament debated them, the laws were passed, their head of government sort of like signed them into law and they became, and they became law. Um, here it was done in, in a judicial way. I do believe that in, um, in these European countries, there was a lot of um, imitation of the, um, of the American civil rights model. Um, there was a lot of, particularly with things like affirmative action and mm. that sort of thing. But you're right. 
this is not the only uh, strain that's running through these decades. There are other things contributing um, to social change. I think that we've just dealt with the civil rights one because that's, it is central to my book, um, but it's, it's also the most controversial um, thing, perhaps, that I've said. Yeah. So, so you have, when you talk about, you know, elites, yeah, you know, there's a, the role of Vietnam in our own, in our own um, sort of social evolution in the 70, 60s and 70s is very strange. You know, a, a strange thing about Vietnam is that our army was mustered uh, according to kind of very antiquated rules. And one of the key things about the rules under which it was mustered is that, that there was a, you know, that there was a draft exemption for um, college students, right. which made a, a great deal of sense in, um, in World War I when, you know, brain power, or let's say trained brain power, was a very rare thing when you had maybe one out of 30 men um, was in higher education. But by the time you get to the end of the 1960s, um, it was closer to one in two men um, were in the university. And, and so it, you had a situation where, you know, if you were in a, in, in a university, you were all set. You, got to, you had a very good life ahead of you. And if you weren't, you were going to Vietnam. Uh, and I think that the thing that was most complicating um, in that is that we lost the war. And because we lost the war, I think that those who did not go didn't face any of the questions that people who don't go to, to wars you, you know, face in, in, in most societies. So it almost looked as if those, you know, those who had not gone had not gone because they were more virtuous. And those who had not gone was also another way of saying the elites. So you had a sort of a, a melding of um, elite status and I told you so mm -hmm. virtue at the end of, of Vietnam. So let's go to polarization. So take us sort of to the present day. So I think a lot of the way that these sort of, and obviously this book ends in 2015, so you're not, you're not pretending to engage in the debates over what's happening after 2016, but every book is going to be seen through the lens of Trump because he's the president. He's sort of obviously the figure that sort of blots out the sun here. Those debates come down to race and class, depending on what your perspective is. If, if there's sort of two stories that are being told here, um, if I'd say that the, the sort of race-based story here is for 50 years since the passage of the Civil Rights Act, America put itself back on the right trajectory. And there's a whole class of people who are aggrieved, embittered, et cetera. Pick your sort of like word for that. Um, and then the class-based argument is obviously that, well, actually, um, during that same period, in ways related both to governance, but also related to economics and culture, um, there actually were groups that were mostly organized by class that were sort of pushed down. How, do you have any thoughts on that sort of dynamic at all? Well, yes. That's mm. So I, I would say that, that, that my book takes a slightly different view that, in a way, maybe reconciles those two things a little bit. I, I would say that there, you know, I talk about two constitutions. Um, and the one is, um, you know, primarily judicial, uh, bureaucratic, aimed at delivering rights. And the other is, you know, the vast and usual, usually silent majority sort of having its way, as we do in, in a perhaps, as we had in a perhaps somewhat mythologized, but certainly also somewhat true picture of America in the 60s and, and before. And that you've had the, the shift of power from the latter constitution to the former constitution, that is from, you know, from mm -hmm. the, 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 let's just say the balance of powers constitution to the, to the rights-based judicial constitution has favored certain people greatly and left others out in the cold. And I think that increasingly you have the parties divided, the Democrats, you know, it's very hard to say 
you know, who's the party of the upper class and who's the party of the, of the, you know, of the working class now? It certainly looks like the Democrats are um, the party of the commanding heights of the economy. And the, if there is such a thing as an oligarchy or a plutocracy, mm. it would seem to be the Democratic Party that represents it. At the same time, the Democratic Party is, is sort of like making much more explicit demands for, for working people. And if you looked at per capita income, it might still be true that Republicans were higher than uh, the Democrats. I, don't, I have not seen mm. that, that number. But I think a good way to, to divide the parties, a more reliable way of dividing the parties, would be to say, you know, Democrats are the party of the, of the new constitution. Mm. Republicans are the party of the old constitution, of the pre-1964 constitution. And, and a couple of things come from that, okay? One is, if you want to be really crude, um, you could say that, that, you know, Democrats look like the party of winners, and Republicans look like the party of losers. Um, I think that Ron Brownstein has tried to say that in his own way when he talks about a, you know, a coalition um, of the ascendant. Mm. But the other thing is, if you do look at it this way, you can see why... Democrats believe that the only thing, that the real thing motivating the uprising against their power structure is race. Um, I don't believe that myself, but it it is related to race at one remove. Mm. So I, I, that's where I want to spend some time because I think the biggest problem I have with an analysis like this is that it almost buys into a leftist framework that the only reason that we have Trump is because of racial or cultural resentment. When, you know, we've spoken with Michael Lind on the first episode of this podcast, mm -hmm. he points out that communities most affected by Chinese trade policy were most more likely to back Donald Trump and to Bernie Sanders. So this isn't necessarily culture. This is has to do with trade and it specifically has to do with discrete economic choices made throughout the late 1980s all the way up until, I guess, permanent normal relations and Chinese entry into the WTO. So what's your response to that? Well, I would say the choices um, <clears throat> actually began earlier. Mm. And, they, and they began in, um, I would say they began around 1980. You could say they had their, their earliest beginnings uh, with the first, with the conservative turn that the Carter administration took with the nomination of, of Paul Volcker as, you know, Fed chief. In 1980, Ronald Reagan came to power. And, and, and I think he did some extraordinary things to avoid the confrontation over these two constitutions that seemed to be happening then. I think that you had a... Um, I think the, the reforms of the 1960s and here we can speak more generally, but, but in a rough sense, I mean around race, around sex, and around America's position in the world. Um, you know, Vietnam, patriotism. I think the reforms of the 1960s were quite unpopular. And the country was headed for a real conflict over them. And Ronald Reagan seemed to be bringing that conflict to the head. To a head, but he actually, he actually appeased it. He actually calmed it down. How did he do that? I would say he did it mostly through debt. And the debt, um, I, I've, you know, we've talked about certain controversial parts of my book. This part might be more controversial among conservatives. All right, but I, but the uh, the debt that he ran um, took many forms. There was the there was the government debt. Right, but I think that the country also began to seek ways to economize on the cost of 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 let's say capital investment. Mm. It um, it began to import labor from abroad in a lot of different ways. I mean, it did. You had first, you know, you had. Obviously, people, immigrants coming in, but outsourcing too was a way of importing cheaper labor. Um, 
and free trade wound up being an abandonment of a certain infrastructure that we had, you know, in favor of consumption then. But again, why is that? Why is that? How is that divorced? How is that not divorced almost entirely from this discussion about civil rights? Why is this, you know, bargain on free trade, on economics, on outsourcing labor? How does that, what does that have to do Mm. with the 1960s and the civil rights? Because to me, that just seems like a consequence of accumulated capital and of a, of a broader kind of neoliberal moment that's, that's, that it doesn't necessarily connect with what you're saying. It may be that too. If, if you read the book, you'll find it, it connects very closely to what Mm. I was saying and it, and it, it connects in this way. You had, as very often often happens in, in politics, you had popular acceptance of a narrowly focused program in, in 1964 to end segregation. It gradually spread to embrace a whole bunch of far-flung and very different programs. As it did, well, let's just say, at the beginning, it wound up being way more expensive than anyone bargained for. I mean, the, the combination of the Great Society, which we can debate it, but it, it seems to me that the, the purpose of the Great Society was to lay down the material bases for the new type of country you're going to have after, after desegregation. Um, the, the, the combined impact of... Um, the Great Society and, and, and Vietnam was, was a change in the, in the, in the scale of, of, of government that was not ratified, that had not been ratified in the same way that the Civil Rights Act had. And so you had this really leviathan government proceeding forward without a lot of popular, um, without a lot of popular support. So people... You know, there was a large enough constituency by now for this new constitution that people weren't willing to do without it. But it was expensive enough that people weren't willing to pay for it. And that is, and that looked like, that tension Mm -hmm. looked like it was going to bring the country down in the mid to late 1970s. That is what Reagan discovered the solution for Got and it. it turns out to have been a temporary solution so here's very interesting. Interesting. So then i think yeah. this will tie this all together then what was the alternative choice that reagan had if we're talking about choice here if if, if if you're saying the choice that he made was debt whether government or private what was the alternate choice that was in front of him yeah and a choice that i would assume we also have today to some degree as well too i you know i i i, I with all due respect i just don't think of things that way. I don't, I don't, I don't, um, I, I'm just sort of trying to lay out and figure out what problems confronted him and, and what he actually did and what it actually meant. I have okay. not, I, I, I have to say, I didn't really spend a lot of time gaming out, you know, alternative routes out of that. It's not a, it's not a policy book. It's a, uh, it's, 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 it's more of a history and I, I think one of the maybe one of the things that's frustrating in a conversation like this is what do we do about it? You've outlined a polarized America. You've traced it back to this, you know, kind of almost extra extra democratic judicial framework. So what what is the policy option available to somebody who wants to see a settlement in this country as our politics realign? Well, it seems to me that, you know, let me repeat. Yeah. I don't. You know, there yeah. is not a um, there is not a five point plan at the end mm-hmm. of this of this book. Um, it how, just you know. How about um, a narrative, but, right? So, but what, I, what better. Yeah, but it's a, it is a narrative. It is a narrative. But I will say, I think that that we are now at the point where there will be no solution that pleases the entire country, because there's something that we haven't really spoken about. There's a, there's a real moral aspect to this. To, to activate this second constitution, to, to sort of like gain the sanction, to sort of like shift, to, to gain the sanction to take a political argument out of the democratic realm 
and put it into the judiciary or the regulatory realm required making a moral case. Mm -hmm. It couldn't just be, you know, like, oh, let's do, do it this way. It had to be, you know, I know you want to vote on this, but America can't wait. People's rights are being denied. This is an emergency, etc. So the movement to the second constitution was always framed in a, in a moral way. And that means that the, the people who believe in the second constitution believe in it passionately. And, and they believe that the people who do not believe in the second constitution are bigots, okay? Mm. The people who do not believe in the second constitution, the people who believe in the pre-1964 constitution, expect to vote more. They, they, they don't accept the legitimacy of judges sort of, sort of making law. So they think the people who believe in the second constitution are totalitarians. So I, I don't see a, I think that we're in a, in a bit of a corner here. Yeah. So before we finish up, something that we've both admired about you is your broader work on the world stage, just in terms of that's everything from the Philippines to France. There's, there's obviously a, a broader sort of dynamic within the industrialized world right now where we're all struggling with, like, I think, a lot of some of these sort of factors, but other sort of factors, too. Did this book inform the way, writing this project, did that inform the way you write about France or you think about the Philippines or those sort of places? Yes, and, and, and vice versa. Mm. I think that everything I do sort of gives me a new perspective on, on the next thing I do. And I'm always, I, I, I always like to sort of seek out new situations that might have a different configuration, you know, uh, and, and, and see see if see if my thoughts about how societies fit together hold up in light of the evidence I gather there. Is there a country whose performance with some of these factors has particularly impressed you? Um, if we're left in a deadlock oh, here, oh, is, oh, there, is there oh, somewhere... That, that's done a really good job. Yeah. Um, well, a really good job of what, I guess? Of mm -hmm. sort of like, of sort of, you know, reconciling the, the increased interest in, in giving... In, in securing people's rights with a traditional um, sort of like democratic um, yeah. sort of like structure. I don't know. I, yeah. I don't think that, I don't think there are countries that have done much better than, than we have. Not optimistic note. I think yeah. that, <laughs> <laughs> no, in all fairness, but no, but in, 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 all, in all fairness, like it's like you said, this is, this is a history. This is, this is the narrative. This isn't a book of policy. And I think that ultimately, I think it's important that we get narratives out there that tell alternate stories than what we may have been received or can have can stomach. And that's, that's very helpful. Yeah. It's been thought provoking. I can tell you that. Okay. Thank you very much. So, thank you so much for joining us, sir. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you both. Thank you. Hey guys, glad you made it this far. We're going to take a second to dive in like we promised and sort of see how we thought the episode went and then also talk about his theories and how that could help us think about the world. Yeah, so broadly, I mean, Marshall, I think both you and I do agree with some of the backlash that he describes. I mean, he's, he is writing in some senses a, a history, which is he, what he tries to cling to throughout the episode. And he does accurately describe there was a backlash to the Civil Rights Act in the immediate, you know, 1970s period. Yeah, and an example he talks about is the idea that after the Civil Rights Act passed, there were riots in LA, there were riots across the country, there were obviously riots in 1968, and a lot of northerners, and he writes about this, didn't understand why those riots were happening. They thought, wait a second, we gave black people in the South rights, why are they still unhappy? And what Colbo describes is this idea that for many people, especially across the country, it wasn't just about equal citizenship. It was about equity in housing, it was about equity in poverty, and this, this was just a good part of the book. I, it was a good part of the book, and, and that, I think that was necessary because I don't want to discount everything he's saying before I give everybody my opinion, which is I fundamentally disagree with the man. I think that Caldwell very much offered a subpar thesis as to our polarization, and I think everybody could, could see this during that episode when I asked him about economics, and he really tried to tie the neoliberal choices on discrete policy choices of trade policy with China and with Mexico to the Reagan revolution as trying to appease some part of the population over civil rights. In my view, that is just a complete misreading of the history there, Marshall. And what's sort of funny there is that 
I think you'll agree with this. I think the more important dates are in the 1990s, right? So look at Ross Perot's candidacy against George H.W. Bush, along with Bill Clinton. Ross Perot wasn't talking about bringing us back to a pre-constitutional order. He was talking about how trade deals, immigration policies, and sort of decisions of the 1980s were the problem of her politics. That's that's exactly right. And again, I actually think the current moment is not have its roots in the Civil Rights Act. I think the current moment has its roots both in the Reagan revolution in terms of ideology, but in terms of discrete practice of the, the rise of the Democratic Leadership Council of the Democratic Party and a general consensus on trade issues and on immigration issues between the right and the left that solidified in the 1990s. Yeah, and as we mentioned at the top of the episode, if you really want to listen to this episode the right way, I would go back and listen to our season two premiere with Michael Lind and J.D. Vance, because ultimately, I think that Lind's idea of thinking about society in terms of power, in terms of if you're a working class person, you don't have the ability to influence our politics, our culture, our economics the same way. Is this a better starting point for thinking about the world? I couldn't agree more. It's it's about increasing the power of the working class citizen and coming to some sort of settlement between the left and the right culturally. I don't think that Caldwell offers us a way forward. And personally, I'm much more comfortable with the idea that there is something to be done rather than the doom and gloom. You know, regardless of whether or not you agree or disagree with Christopher in this episode, I actually wanted to thank him for coming on, especially because what we sought to do with this podcast is build a space where these really controversial but important arguments can be had, and it means a lot to people who come on there and hold their own and be respectful. So with that, we'll be back next week. Don't forget to rate us five stars or subscribe wherever you get your podcast. We will see you guys later. Later.